three, two. Hello, everyone. Y'all have no idea how incredibly I am excited about today's webinar. One, because this is the first one we've ever done internationally, which is part of the reason why we have a slight delay in getting started today. But our guest is the amazing and brilliant Dr. Heidi Havick today. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with her because she has been on a world tour, including zipping all across the U.S. for like the last year to 18 months. I had the incredible pleasure of being booked in every state with her for about six weeks straight last fall, and it was phenomenal. And I can tell you that she is as beautiful on the inside as she is on the outside, an absolute genius, incredibly funny, um, and all around just amazing person. Um, I really want to encourage you, if you haven't already read her book, The Reality Check, to please check it out. Um, it's a quest to understand chiropractic from the inside out. Beautifully written by a beautiful person. Um, so everyone, please welcome the Dr. Heidi Havoc to our webinar series today. Thanks, Christy. That was a beautiful introduction. <laughs> One of the most beautiful introductions I've ever had. I'm all touched now. Anyway, I'll get going. Um, I've been invited to talk to you guys about how to talk about science and research in practice. Um, so I'm going to go straight into it. Um, for those of you who don't necessarily um, know me very well, I'll start with a little introduction, if I can get my slides working. I'm having trouble with the slides, Christy. Here, just double click on that left side where it says manage slides. Click on slide one, then go up there and hit next. There it goes. There we go. Is it working now? Now I keep getting a little it, message saying, says this is the last slide. That's weird. Nope, it's working. I see it popping up. Sorry about this, guys. We've always got to have some technological challenges, don't we? It won't do anything. Oh, my goodness. Please forgive us, everyone. Why don't you exit out of the screen and click back in and see what happens and see if that is... Like right from the beginning? Yeah. Right from the beginning, log out. back in? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that may work. It could be that I'm the one who messed it up because I just uploaded a ton of videos on the back side and it could be acting funky because of that. And guys, that would be my videos I'm keen to show you. So um, if I can multitask while we're doing this, I could start introducing myself anyway. So I am a chiropractor. I graduated from the New Zealand College of Chiropractic in 99. And uh, I went on to study uh, science at Auckland University. Uh, I was really interested in trying to understand the effects of the adjustment. So that's why I went on and, and studied at Auckland University and ended up doing a PhD uh, in human neurophysiology. Uh, and after that, I, um, so I was practicing, you know, I'd graduated, I had two little kids and I was uh, studying uh, the effects of adjusting the spine on the brain. Sorry, Christy, this isn't even logging on now. Oh, no. Major problems. Um, can you manage the slides? Because I know I, my slides, so I, I could. I sure if can. You, if you could take over the managing. I am. I've got your all of your pictures up on that slide where you're talking about your background. Perfect. So you've got all four. So what you guys should be seeing there is uh, this is little me because I grew up in, in Norway, which is why I've got a strange accent. Um, but my mother is a New Zealander and my father's Norwegian. So I'm bilingual, hence the two spags. And then you've got me there graduating from the New Zealand College of Chiropractic in 1999 and then ending up with a PhD in 2008 from Auckland University. And what people are less aware of is that my great-grandfather was one of the first thousand chiropractors ever to graduate from Palmer College. So I'm quite proud of that now. It actually took me a little while before I got there. So if we go to the next slide, um, I put the handouts of today, but I'm sure Christy might be able to get this to you as well, but I have already uploaded it to I have a closed Facebook group where people tend to follow me, uh, and it's a closed one for the public. So it's a great place to ask questions if you have any questions. And any handouts from any talks that I ever give, I tend to upload 
to this group. And if you can see the two photos of me there as well, uh, one is just, just to indicate that if you're trying to befriend me on Facebook, I'm not trying to ignore you. I just, my private Facebook page is full. So I actually have a public page. So you want to be looking for that professional looking photo if you want to follow me on Facebook. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is just my team at the New Zealand College of Chiropractic. So my full-time role since uh, about 2006 uh, is, is as research director at the New Zealand College of Chiropractic. So since about 2014, we established a center for chiropractic research because our little team, the research that we've been producing has become such a, a, a big deal uh, around the world because we've sort of discovered at least one way that adjusting the spine actually affects the central nervous system. So it means that we've figured out one way that chiropractic care actually works. Uh, and that's, that's obviously kind of cool. So if we go to the next slide again, um, just wanted to po point out that a lot of the work that we've been doing over the years, it's not just work that, that um, you know, we have funded ourselves, although we've got quite a bit of money through the New Zealand government, but a lot of different organizations has helped support us. And a lot of the work that we've done too has also been done in collaboration with a lot of other scientists, and many of them aren't chiropractors. Uh, so moving along to the next slide, um, what I really want to highlight with this is I've literally spent the last 20 years of my life studying chiropractic. Uh, and so along the way, we've done lots and lots of studies. A lot of them have been what's called basic science studies, which looks at how something works as opposed to does it work, which is more the clinical research field. And, and based on all this work, I've been presenting a lot all around the world on, on what this mechanism of chiropractic care is. And one thing I discovered pretty early on, which is why I popped the book into this slide, uh, what I discovered pretty early on is that when I was explaining how this, how this works, the, the research that we'd done, uh, a lot of chiropractors and chiropractic students found it really difficult to understand. So that's why I ended up writing the book, The Reality Check. So it's available on Amazon. It it's, uh, should be really, really easy to get hold of. Although I do know some people are selling it on Amazon for about a, a small fortune. So it shouldn't be expensive. <laughs> Otherwise, you're on the wrong site. So if we're moving along to the next slide, um, what I wanted to cover today, obviously I can't talk about too much in, in, in just an hour about talking about research. But I wanted to cover a couple of aspects about how to use research or how to talk about research and practice. And, and what I wanted, or why this is so important for us practitioners to do, is that the best way of um, practicing, which is sort of recognized around the world these days, is what's known as evidence-informed practice. So patient-centered, evidence-informed practice. And there's also a lot of confusion about what that really means, because some people sort of bastardize this whole theory and really only let you talk about or do uh, uh, chiropractic practices that are that have you know got lots of clinical research evidence for but that's not really how evidence-informed practice is, is supposed to be it's not how it was originally designed and nor how it's actually written about so that's why i'm bringing it up because real evidence-based practice or evidence-informed practice is taking into account three equally important things when you've got a patient in front of you and then together coming up with the best plan moving forward so the three equally important things that you're meant to consider is you're meant to discuss and share with the patient the best evidence or research evidence about the issues that the patient has presented with you for. And then also equally important to talk about your clinical experience because your clinical experience is always going to be ahead of the research. I mean, it takes a long time to do research. So what you see in practice is usually ahead of the game, well ahead of what we do research-wise, which is also why it's considered equally important. And the third equally important thing to consider to practice in an evidence-informed manner is to literally sit down with the patient and have a discussion with them. Once you've shared the, the best available evidence, your clinical experience, it's really down to what the patient wants. So having that real patient perspective, patient input, and having a real discussion about what it is that they're interested in is also considered equally important. So I'm gonna go through a few examples about this and how we can do this in practice. If we go to the next slide, what I wanna highlight with all these little puzzle pieces is that each little study or research study that we ever do, I'd like you to consider it a little puzzle piece, like one little puzzle piece. So obviously to have a full idea about um, what's going on, we would actually need a lot more than just a single puzzle piece. So if we go to the next slide, the way we actually design one of these little puzzle pieces is that we start, we researchers start with an overall working model. 
So we have a theory about what's going on. We narrow it down then to a testable question. Then we test it with the scientific method. And then we end up with some results. Uh, and then we have to interpret our results. So basically go through that entire process. And that gives you one little puzzle piece. So you can imagine then if sometimes you've created your little puzzle piece, but sometimes these puzzle pieces don't actually fit together. You know, and the point then is not to bring out the sledgehammer, but you actually sometimes need to reevaluate the working model if your little puzzle pieces don't fit together. So if you move on, Christy, to the slide with the uh, incomplete puzzle picture on it, the point of this is when I'm trying to explain you know, how chiropractic care works, or if you're trying to explain to patients in practice how chiropractic care works, you know, we don't actually have the full picture yet. We've only really got an incomplete puzzle picture based on a few studies that have been done. So a lot of it is guesswork, which is why I travel around the world so much, uh, sharing with chiropractors, what do we know? You know, what are the little puzzle pieces that we do know? And based on that, in my experience, you know, 20 years experience as a chiropractor and a, uh, and a neurophysiologist, a, a scientist, what do I think the big picture looks like? Because, you know, that's what we have to do as scientists is also guess based on the available science, what do we think this big picture looks like? And then it's our job to, to test out those theories one by one. And we just keep going and keep going and making more puzzle pieces. So another thing that you have to do if we move on to the next slide, you know, once you are sharing the literature, um, it's, it's, um, it's not just finding one study and then, you know, rattling on about it to your patient. It's, it's a real systematic approach. So it's literally starting with, you know, what are the health concerns of the patient? They, they come with, to you with, with issues that they'd really like help with. It's your job then as a, as a healthcare professional, a primary healthcare professional, to search the literature on that topic. And then not just search the literature, but also critique the literature. And this doesn't mean ripping it apart, you know, and slagging it off or anything like that. It's, it's summarizing what research is out there. It's looking at the quality of it. It's being fair and reasonable. It's actually not about your opinion. It's what does the evidence say. And it's very, very important too to be using the correct guidelines if you're evaluating studies because there's many different types of studies and each different type of study or study methodology needs to be evaluated according to the way it was meant to be. Another thing to keep in mind in all of this too is that there are things out there or journals out there called predatory journals. They're actually not real research journals. They're actually fake journals and they literally make money out of this. So people pay and sometimes they don't even know and they've paid to have a, you know, their article submitted to a, a journal that isn't even a real journal. This means that the study doesn't actually get peer reviewed, which means it's not actually real research. So it's called fake science or pseudoscience. So then after you've done all of your Summarizing, uh, searching, uh, reviewing on this particular topic, you then it, it becomes your your problem, your problem. Then it becomes your um, opportunity to have that discussion with your patient. You know, what does the science say? How does this fit with your clinical experience on this topic? And then together you sit down and have a discussion. You know, what should the plan be going forward? So, I'll, I'll, Christy, I'll just get you to skip the next slide with the um, the different rooms in the house. So just click through till you get to the Horvick Research slide. The whole point of um, Horvick Research is the company that I've started up. So in addition to being the, the research director at the New Zealand College of Chiropractic, I've literally made it my mission now to enlighten the world about the science of chiropractic, to share with not just the chiropractic profession, but also other healthcare professionals and the public, what does the science say about chiropractic care? And what we've put together is like a, a little online library. Uh, there's a website to that, drheidi.net is a, is a very good website. It's got connections to lots of different sites that, uh, and links that we have available, different resources. And because what we've really done is put together an online uh, uh, um, resource library. So there's a, another slide there now, Christy, with the, the green, the purple, and the blue boxes. What we really do for the chiropractic profession is we take all the hard work out of that research component of those three pillars of evidence-based practice. So we search the literature. I've got a group of PhD trained scientists. We, we you know, systematically search the literature topic by topic. We evaluate the literature, we summarize it, and then we even translate it, not into just 
you know, easier understand language for you chiropractors, but we also translate it into easy to understand language for patients themselves. So I'm going to give you some examples of this in a little minute. But if we go on to the next study, if you're in practice and you had a, you've come across a, a, an article that you think is really, really cool and you want to talk about it, I want to talk you through you know, how we tra train the chiropractic students at the New Zealand College how to share an individual study. We always say that the best thing to do is talk about four things. For every study, try and keep in mind four things. And the four things is, number one, what did the researchers do? And number two is, what did they actually find? Then comes a very important step, and that's actually translating what the researchers found to a patient in front of you. They don't necessarily get it. It's actually quite important that you translate what does this mean to a, to a normal human being that's come into your office. And then the last thing we always also say it's very important to do is to have a little chat about the strengths and limitations, because every single research study has strengths and limitations. There's some good points. And there's also some limitations. doesn't mean it's a negative thing. It just means that there are things you can't claim based on a single study. So I'm going to talk you through a couple of examples. But in the next slide, it's just a little bit more information there. And you'll, you'll get this in your handout so that you've got it, you know, a little bit more details about what does it mean to say what they did, what they found, what does that actually mean to a patient in front of you, and then strengths and limitations. So if we go to the next slide, slide which is basically one example, study. It's a seed forward activation study. This was published in 2006 in JMPT by Paul Marshall and Bernadette Murphy. And it's a really cool study. If you flip to the next slide, Christy, the seed forward activation with the two, uh, with the two little black men and then the, the other dude with his arm going out. So just to sort of uh, talk you through what the study was, um, they, got, uh, they got about 90 healthy asymptomatic young guys in and they were recording those two little yellow uh, blobs uh, on the shoulder and over the stomach muscles there indicate that they were recording EMG, so electrical uh, myographic activity, over the shoulder muscle and over the stomach muscle. They were stood in front of a, a screen and either an L would show up or an R would show up. So if the L showed up, they had to lift their right arm as fast as they could straight up in front of them to 90 degrees and hold it there. And if the R showed up, they had to do the same thing but with the right arm. So that was their only instruction was literally to lift their arm up either the left or the right to 90 degrees as fast as they could. So if you flip to the next slide, I had a little animation here showing these little um, red arrows are going to be coming in uh, one by one. So in a normal um, situation, in a healthy spine, the brain will actually activate your core abdominal muscles before it will send any messages to your shoulder muscle to lift it up, even though all you're trying to do is lift your arm up. If you're standing there in front of a screen, you're trying to lift your arm up as fast as you can, your brain will actually first switch on your abdominal muscles, then switch on your shoulder muscles. And it does this to protect your spine. If it didn't do this, you'd have like a little mini uh, whiplash situation in your low back each time you lift your arm up because of the changes in gravity. So what these guys did in their study, and you know, they, were, they were testing these 90 um, healthy asymptomatic young guys, they actually found that 17 of them couldn't pre-activate their abdominal muscles before there was any activity in their shoulder muscle. So that's almost 20%. It was like 18.8% or 18.9% could not pre-activate their abdominal muscles appropriately. Now, we know from other research that this is not a good thing. Uh, a different study, a completely different study, has shown in 300 young college students that, that um, those young, healthy college students that couldn't appropriately preactivate their abdominal muscles prior to, to you know, other, other limb muscles. And they could actually predict those guys that couldn't do it, those guys would actually be the ones that ended up with a low back injury at the end of that um, uh, year. So it's, it almost predicts who will end up with a low back injury, which is, which is really, really interesting. Even though, remember, all of these guys are totally asymptomatic. Then they got these guys back in, the guys that couldn't preactivate. Um, but time went by. They were supposed to sort of wait a week and then get them back in. But, you know, oftentimes stuff happens, you know, that we don't predict in, in science. So six months later, they managed to get hold of 13 out of the 17 that had this impaired ability to preactivate their abdominal muscles. And, they, and these 13 still couldn't preactivate their abdominal muscles, which really tells us that, that, you know, six months of normal active daily living doesn't change this measure. And then Bernadette Murphy, who's a chiropractor as well, she adjusted these guys. She adjusted their sacroiliac joints. 
and there was an almost 38% improvement in their feed forward activation times, which is a huge amount. I mean, 48, you know, 40, almost 40% improvement. In some of these individuals, it was a complete swap around. So originally, they'd, they were activating their shoulder muscle, and then like 50 milliseconds later, they were suddenly switching on their core abdominal muscles. It's, it's like the brain's gone, oh my goodness, the arm's gone up, we better switch the core muscles on. And in some of these guys, there was a complete reversal. So when they were lifting their arm up after the adjustment, um, their abdominal muscle was switching on clearly before there was any activity in the shoulder muscle, which is the ideal healthy way of doing it. So I want to show you now an example of how we turn these into little animations. So what we do is we do a whole review on this kind of topic for you guys, for chiropractors, and that's you know about 10 minutes long or something like that. And then we have a little you know two to three minute little whiteboard animation thing. So Christy, if you could play that um, and then let me know when it's finished because I won't be able to either see or hear it. I'll go on. Are you able to play that video, Christy? It's playing now. Sorry. Okay, Heidi, we're done with the video. Perfect. So on the next couple of slides, I've really just put these um, words down for you so that you can actually see, uh, you know, if you wanted to actually talk about this particular experiment. I think I've got the control back again, uh, Christy. Is that right? No. So in the in the second slide as well, uh, there's just the answers to these to these questions. You know, what did they do? What did they find? Um, what does it actually mean if you were to describe this to someone in your practice? And then moving on to, well, what about, what are the limitations? What are the shortcomings of this, of this kind of a study? For example, in this case, if you'd explained that there was a 90 healthy, asymptomatic young students that were tested 
and you know almost 20 percent of them couldn't preactivate their abdominal muscles six months later they were retested the guys that couldn't do it and they still couldn't do it and then they got adjusted and there was an almost 40 percent improvement in the feed forward activation time and then i've gone to explain well you know why is this relevant to someone in your practice well all young healthy college students because this is where I bring into that other study, which I've got referenced there, the Kolowiki study as well, where you know it's known that if you can't activate your core abdominal muscles appropriately, this could lead to low back injuries. So you know it's worth maybe getting checked and adjusted on a regular basis. We don't really have evidence for that yet, though we can't. So that's why you've got to bring up the limitations of a study like this as well. Like we haven't done a study yet showing that. Um, young kids that get uh, adjusted, I mean young teenagers that get adjusted regularly, if they get chiropractic care, does it prevent them having low back injuries? We haven't done that study yet. And that's why it's important to highlight the limitations of a single study like this. So this just gives you an example. If we move on to the next slide, um, this is a, a, a study looking at joint position sense or the accuracy with which the brain knows where your arm is in space. There we go. So there's a photo there of uh, you can see we've got someone lying on a whiteboard and what you've got here this little black device is an electrogoniometer so we can very accurately record the angle of that elbow joint and underneath her wrist and her, uh, her elbow there's these blue cloth donuts and they are there so, to keep her arm off the whiteboard itself so that they don't get any cues from uh, moving skin on a board so they're actually sort of freely moving their arm in, in just they're just on those uh, blue cloth donuts uh, and if you look at the next uh, slide, I don't know if it's you or me, Christy, but we're getting there. Uh, you can also see that this is this is as much as I could actually adjust these subjects for this study. Again, I'm on my knees just down here trying to adjust this guy who's being, he's literally salitates to that whiteboard. And then he moves his arm. I don't know if you can see the little marks on either side of his hand, his upside turned hand. So we didn't move the arm large angles. The reason for this is if you go to end range of a joint motion, there's a lot more different sensors that come into it. They get the stretch of the skin and the joint receptors that also tell the brain what's going on. But if you're just moving the arm in very small ranges of motion, sort of right in the middle there, like he was, but, but around 90 degrees, then you're mainly relying on, because the eyes are closed, you're mainly relying on your muscle spindle information. And for those of you who have followed any of our research in the past, um, this is very relevant because we've shown multiple times that we change the way the brain processes deep muscle afferent information from the hand area. So we wanted to see then in this study, does that mean that we're actually improving proprioceptive processing? Because that's what it would indicate if it was a positive finding. So, so that's why we followed it up. So off we go on to the next slide again. That's the, the, um, the next um, video, Christy. Just talks you through how we would present this to uh, the public. And if Chris, you just let me know when, when that one's finished.
Your video is finished, Heidi. Excellent. So moving right along, where are we up to now? Now everything's changed on me. Here we go. So um, again, the whole point of these little animations is we've provided you with an example of how you can talk about an individual study, because both of these are actually published research studies. And if you wanted to share this kind of research with your patients, that's what these little animations are there for. The animations themselves, um, our members use, they have them in their uh, waiting room. They often play them in their waiting room or they have them on their websites. And then we have even more information for you so that you know much more about it than just the little whiteboard animation. So if any of your patients ask you even more questions about it, then you have more of this knowledge up your sleeve. So again, in, this, um, in these next couple of slides is, again, just, just literally answers for you if you wanted to talk about it. So again, what you would want to do is, what did they do? You'd want to ex explain, describe what they actually did, and you would then want to explain what the results were. So again, we had 25 uh, subjects with the subclinical pain and 18 healthy controls. And then just explain that the only difference between these guys is one group, they were all pain-free, but one group had a history of recurring ache, pain, or tension in their spine. And so then we compared these two groups and how able they were to, of their brains to sense where their arm was in space when they closed their eyes. And then I'd explain that uh, these guys, um, that the people with a history of joint dysfunction or spinal dysfunction, they were less able to, to know where their elbow joint was. And so what, what that tells us, which is really, really interesting, is spinal dysfunction is actually interfering with the brain, the brain the accuracy with which the brain knows where your arm is in space. And that's kind of really quite cool because what we've also shown then in the, in the same study is we adjusted those people that have that spinal joint dysfunction. Obviously, we adjusted subluxations that we found. I mean, we're chiropractors. And again, what we found then is it improved their ability to know more accurately where their elbow joint was in space. Not quite to the degree of that healthy comparison group, that healthy group that had never had any spinal problems, but at least improved it significantly. What was also quite interesting out of this study, and I, I don't know, I can't remember if that shows up in the video or not, is these guys, because of the way they're taped, if you can see on the photo there, we've got their arm extended a little bit quite backwards. And a lot of these guys were complaining that they were getting uh, numbness and tingling uh, down their arm, almost like we were inducing, um, uh, almost like we were inducing like uh, thoracic outlet syndrome. And so that why it was, that's probably why the control group was actually getting worse after that we did nothing. They were actually less accurately able to know. But not only in the chiro group, not only did they not get worse, they actually improved. So it's like a double effect, which we thought was pretty cool. And then going on, I'll go in and explain then um, to these people, you know, to the person in your practice, you know, what does this actually mean? Well, this might actually mean that chiropractic care makes you more accurately aware of where your limbs are. But spinal function, you, you need your spine to function properly to be accurately aware of where your arms and legs are in space. Um, obviously, in this study, it was only arms we looked at. And so, again, I'd go even as far as explaining that what's the, what this could mean is if you've got spinal joint dysfunction, it could mean that your brain doesn't know where, say, your arm is accurately in space. So you might knock your elbow and door frames. You know, you might, if you've got less accurate awareness of where your spine is, you might, you know, whack your head getting into a car. Um, if you don't quite know accurately where your foot is, you might stub your toe. So that's what I mean about translate what this means to a patient. They don't necessarily understand what proprioception means. So if you're just saying, oh, you know, that improved brain's awareness of where the arm is, you literally need to say, well, what could that mean for them? That could mean that spinal dysfunction or being subluxated can make you more clumsy. And I don't know about you, but I often used to see these little kids that would be walking around that can't walk five meters without tripping over their own feet. And I always used to cringe and my hands would ache to, <laughs> to check and adjust their spines. But anyway. And then I'd also mention again, of course, limitations of the study, because all studies have limitations. In this particular study, if you were sharing this particular study with them, I'd point out that, you know, all the people in the study were young people, you know. Um, and you'd almost say if it was an older person who was the patient who was seeing you, you might need to say that, you know, maybe it's a little bit different in older people. But then you could also point out, however, you know, you, you know of another study that was actually done in older adults, and in that case, they looked at ankle proprioception, but they adjusted them over several weeks. But over a four-week period of chiropractic care, just adjusting spinal subluxations, it improved 
these older adults' brains awareness of where their ankle joint was. So it's pretty much the same study, but in older adults, but they were adjusted for four weeks. We don't know if one adjustment does the same thing. Another thing that I'd point out in both of these studies, both the first example and the second example, is we don't know how long this effect lasts. So, you know, this, this particular study, it was only like one pre and post adjustment for the elbow joint. We, we, we haven't followed it up. And that's just the way science goes. You, you know, until you actually show that a phenomena exists, you're not really allowed to waste people's time to measure how long a phenomena that you don't know if it exists, how long that lasts. So the first study, you really need to, you know, test, does it change, you know, accuracy of elbow proprioception if it does then I could do a next study and then I could test well how long does it last from one adjustment and then of course I could look at well does different technique matter and then of course I could look at the skill level matter and then I could look at you know what about four weeks of chiropractic care does that improve and so on and so on and so on so all things with research every time you've done a study and you've got that little puzzle piece it's it's sort of begging you to do about 10 more studies and that's that's where we run into trouble because to do even just a single one of these little studies is about 150,000 US dollars. So I don't have a, you know, a whole lot of 150,000 in spare change lying around, but if anyone else does, please do share because we have so many more studies to do. So anyway, moving along to the next slide, what I thought I'd do now is just change tax a little bit and just talk about, okay, what about you know, we've looked at now how to talk about like an individual study. And remember, there's four things that you want to bring up in any individual study if you're sharing it, what they did, what they found, translate what that means to the patient in front of you, and then discuss strengths and limitations. But what about a whole body of research? So for example, what if someone asked you, you know, can chiropractic care help babies with colic? You know, there, there's actually a lot of studies that have been done on this particular topic. So I'm going to give you again a couple of examples on two different topics um, where there's a lot of evidence and another example where there's not a lot of evidence and then how to deal with both of those. So when it comes to babies and colic, there's actually multiple clinical trials that's been done and that have shown that chiropractic care can help reduce crying times in babies that cry excessively, so babies or infants with colic. Another thing to point out, or I like to point out, is you know, in one of these studies, which was a really decent study, they actually showed that they reduced the crying time by half. Now that's quite a big deal. So I'd also point out that there's a lot of individual variability. So some babies might may, may just cry a little bit less, but other babies can cry significantly less. So, you know, you know, we're all individuals. Another thing that has been done, and I would also point out when it comes to, for example, chiropractic care with colic, is that even if, you know, the parents don't need to know whether, whether the babies are getting chiropractic care, because a lot of the early clinical trials, they didn't blind the parents. So some of the scientists then look at, you know, and review the topic and they would criticize this for, you know, well, it could be that the parents are biased, you know, and that's, that's fair enough. So, but what's been quite cool is now there's been a, a couple of studies that actually have blinded the parents. And again, it didn't seem to matter. So the kids that got the chiropractic care, the babies that got the chiropractic care, they did respond well and, you know, significantly better and cried less. We also know that chiropractic care is very safe for, you know, all, all members of, the, of society. And so it's worth pointing that out as well. On, on these topics, for example, you know, what does the research say about chiropractic care for babies with colic? We've done a whole review on that on our resource library, on our membership, our online membership. So you could listen to a, you know, one and a half hour talk just about all the different research that's covered looking at colic. And then again, we've done exactly the same thing as before. We've made a little animation. So how could you talk about this um, to patients in your practice? So Christy, if you could just play that one for me. And that'd be awesome.
sweet. So the, the, the point of these little animations is it, it gives you an example of, of the language to use to talk about one of these studies. And this, this uh, animation was, was specifically talking through one particular study. Um, that was that was done. This Miller study from 2012, and one of the cool things about this study too, when you when you think about the limitations of it, because uh, most people think that the limitations is a is a negative thing, but limitations can sometimes be also a positive thing. Like for example, how we highlight in the in the video there that that the chiropractic care that was given uh, to these babies was actually you know chiro chiropractic students. So imagine how much better care could be provided. If it's a fully fledged chiropractor with you know 30 years experience uh, taking care of, of babies on a regular basis, so sometimes limitations of studies can actually also you know be a, a positive thing. I'll give you a completely different example, and when it comes to chiropractic care for for say kids with bedwetting, is a is a different condition obviously. Now this topic has been much less studied, so there's really only one study that I can find, uh, one decent clinical trial, a couple of case studies and things like that as well. Again, we, we cover the evidence that is available and, and go into more detail in the videos that we do for you about for the chiropractor for this. But then we also make a little animation about this one particular study. But in this case, like it would be very important to highlight to the patient that you know, there's only one study, there's only one real decent study. What was really interesting in this study was that only 25%, it was still a positive finding that you know, there was this significant effect that chiropractic care did reduce bedwetting uh, in these kids in this study. But what was interesting was that only 25% of the children that got chiropractic care actually responded. So what came out of this study was that there were responders and non-responders. Again, you know, the, the care could be um, interesting. There could be other things that one could have tried in conjunction with, say, adjustments. Um, but, but what was interesting is that those 25% of kids that did respond, they got over 50% better. So when you think about it like that, you know, I would always highlight to parents, you know, if, if someone asked me, uh, can chiropractic care help with kids with bedwetting, I'd point out from a research perspective, there's only really one clinical trial that I'm aware of and in that case, only 25% of kids that received chiropractic care responded and, and responded positively. However, those 25% got 50% better. And considering the fact that most kids really quite enjoy chiropractic care and it's, and it's safe, it's really well worthwhile giving it a go, if that's something they want to go, give a go. I'll then talk about my own clinical experience. And, usually, and my clinical experience in this case is that is actually mirrored what we've seen in the, in the research, that some kids respond really, really well to chiropractic care with bedwetting, but some don't. So, you know, worth giving it a go if that's something that they want to try. So I'll give you, um, actually, just in, um, for the sake of time, Christy, if we just skip the next video, and I'm just going to go on to, because I'm, oh, no, actually, we have got time. Let's play that one as well. If we can play that um, bedwetting video now, that would be awesome. The colic animation again, and not the bedwetting one. I think it is too. I was actually just messaging you, going, um, I don't think this is the right video. I think <laughs> we, I may have uploaded the same video two times. Don't worry about it. Not. We'll just go on because I've still got a few more things that I wanted to cover anyway. So, okay. so the whole, the whole point, the whole point of when you, when you discuss research. Um, you know, it, in all of these little examples that I've talked about, they've all been there in, in each of those little animations too. They're about an individual study. And in each of them, what we've tried to do is those four key points to discuss what was done, what did the researchers find, what does this actually mean? So we try and translate it into a, you know, real life situation. And then we try and touch on, you know, strengths and limitations. So there's many, many um, uh, topics that people would come and see a chiropractor for. 
and not a lot of time. And that's why we have this uh, uh, membership, this online resource library available for you at our uh, realitycheck.com. So if you, if you go on to that site and you wanted to go on, you can first go on and then you get to this site here, this, this page, and you see there's different sections there. So there's the animation section, there's the science mastery section, the media is for social media, and then there's a link to our online shop. So under the science mastery section there, and this is where we've got a whole lot of resources that is to educate the chiropractor on different topics. So the first thing that you'll find here is all our health talks. So we've, we've given um, talks on these topics, or I have given talks on these topics to uh, multiple different groups. So what I tend to do is then upload uh, different talk slides so that if you wanted to like, download the PowerPoint, listen to me give the talk, but you can then download the PowerPoint and you can change that to your liking. So if you wanted to introduce yourself, obviously we give you examples of this. And again, everything on this site is fully referenced. So if you want anyone to follow up on what it is that you've talked about and they, they look into what, what it is that you've shared in, in any way, shape or form, everything has been fully referenced. So people can follow up and find out that the, this information that you are sharing is based on real research studies. If you scroll down on this page, what you will come to is a whole lot of what we call science gems. So these are the videos for you chiropractors on multiple different topics. So obviously we start with, you know, what, what are these mechanisms that I've spent 20 years uh, discovering? How does chiropractic care actually change the central nervous system? Uh, and we go through multiple um, uh, topics just on that, but we've covered a whole range of things, everything from uh, anything from sports injuries to uh, different parts of the brain that we know we have affected, uh, to pregnancy, to um, and, and, and every month we add new material. So again, you can just scroll through and see, you know, whatever topic it is you're interested in. If you keep scrolling down on the same site, you're still under the science uh, mastery section, you'll then come to summaries to share. So people have asked us for written summaries on a topic because they might want to uh, take this uh, to their local uh, news stations or media stations. Uh, they might want to put it into uh, radio stations to, you know, just to, to see if they can get an interview. Any ways to, to or to even share with their patients in their practice. So for every of these topics that, you know, we've just shown on the slide above, any of these topics, we're now working our way through and creating little summaries to share. So this is a double-sided A4 page, and again, fully referenced. And the references are on the page where we summarize, you know, what about chiropractic care for older adults, or what are the effects of the adjustment, or what does the research say about maintenance care, or bedwetting, or colic, and so on, and so on. Um, what we also have is every time I give a webinar myself uh, from our site, we record those webinars and at the end of our Science Mastery section, they're also freely available to all our online members on this uh, online resource library. So, so far I've given webinars on chiropractic care for kids or chiropractic care for older adults. I've also done a webinar on talking about the subluxation. Obviously, it's a bit of a contentious issue for our wonderful profession. And so I've talked about what a subluxation is based on the scientific research. What, and what evidence do we have for that? And then what happens when we adjust the subluxation? I've also done a whole other webinar on why do we get subluxated? And what does the research evidence tell us about if we actually have injured a spine? And then the latest one I did was this one on the prefrontal cortex. Because one of our key findings is that chiropractic care changes a part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. What's quite amazing about the prefrontal cortex is that it is directly linked to our autonomic nervous system, to the vagus nerve, to our, you know, our, our parasympathetic healing nervous system. It's also directly linked to our um, emotional control, uh, endocrine system, uh, immune system, and inflammatory conditions. So it literally gives us a biologically plausible mechanism for why people could impact, why chiropractic care could impact a whole range of things, anything from uh, cancers to diabetes to mental health disorders to autoimmune diseases to endocrine disorders to functional gastro gastrointestinal disorders. I'm just about falling over my tongue here and so on and so on. It's a four and a half hour webinar. There was just so much to discuss in that. So plus on top of that, that's just the science mastery section. So you can also go on into the animation section. And going on to the animation section, we have almost 40 different animations now. There's those little whiteboard animations that I've been showing you some examples of. Again, we work our way through the, what are the effects of the adjustment? How does it affect, affect the brain? Um, how do symptoms arise? What are symptoms? Uh, you know, what is the effect 
of chiropractic care on colic? You know, what, what are the effects of chiropractic care on the prefrontal cortex? You know, what does this mean? What are the effects of stress on the brain? And can chiropractic care uh, make a difference there? And so on and so on and so on. There's about 40 of them. But just a warning in case there's anybody that's listening to this podcast who's from the UK or Canada or uh, Australia, because and, and, and even be aware in the different states that the advertising rules can vary. So, for example, in these three places, Australia, Canada, and the UK, the advertising rules are actually quite strict. So you're not allowed to externally advertise about anything unless we as a profession have a very high level of what's known as clinical research evidence. And then we really don't have a lot of high-level clinical research evidence for very many things. Mainly it's about pain, like headaches, pain, plasticity. Um, I've lost my thing there. Okay. Um, so if it, it, you know, it always pays to be very, very careful where, where, what your advertising rules are. The reason I bring this up is because some places you can't externally advertise every single topic that we have, for example, made an animation about. What you can do is all of it is, is safe no matter where you practice in-house because it's all based on scientific studies and you are there to explain the limitations. But what they talk about in these countries where there's stricter rules is you can only externally advertise. And when I mean externally advertise, I'm talking about putting it on your website, in emails, and in social media. They have to be very careful. So I'm just putting the warning out there just in case your actual state, you, you need to uh, also check in what, what you're okay or allowed to talk about in an external marketing event. But in many places, you know, you're allowed to talk about any research studies, which is really, really cool. So then you could have any of these little whiteboard animations on your website. Uh, you could email out links to your entire database because they're all smartphone compatible and the person can actually watch the actual little animation on their phone. And so if they're advised you, they can share that with their friends and family. It's a great way to educate the public about the science of chiropractic and it's a great way for them to be able to share it with other people. I just bring that warning, just make sure it's okay in your, in your region. So on top of the little animations, we have then a whole lot of what we call social media content. So if you go under the social media content, then we have, you know, there's here there's like too many, too many to even put on the slides, but we have what we call snippets. They're, they're the little animations, but they're cut into even shorter snippets. For social media, people's attention span is not that long, so we keep them really, really short. Uh, and, and it just is a way you can schedule any of this content. There is heaps of this social media content. So if you spent an hour a month, you could just then schedule your entire month's uh, social media um, campaigning or awareness campaigning. There's also a whole lot of little quotes. So there's not just the snippets, but there's also uh, a whole lot of little quotes. Again, uh, we will reference it by the reference to my book or to an actual study. But again, there's heaps and heaps of these different quotes. So you can pick a topic basically and you can, you can advertise uh, around it. So just coming up very soon, I'm also going to do a webinar, uh, if you're interested, on the whole, the brain pain and the neuroplastic effect of chiropractic care. So it's uh, one of the main reasons that I picked this topic for this webinar is because of the trouble uh, for the external marketing for uh, Canada, Australia, and the UK. But it will also, it, it's also great because so many people come and see us because they're in pain. And what a lot of the research is showing us these days is pain is created in the brain, not that they're malingering, but it's by your subconscious brain creates the feeling of pain for you. And that this pain can become chronic uh, become a, a chronic problem because the brain is changing or because it, the brain is neuroplastic. So I'm going to cover all of this, you know, how, how you, know, you know, what neuroplasticity is or maladaptive neuroplasticity and how a lot of chronic pain is actually can be more of a brain, a learnt brain problem that actually is a tissue pathology problem. And, you know, it, again, it will probably be a reasonably long um, webinar. We charge $39, I believe. Uh, and there should be a link for this at that same uh, website, uh, drheidi.net. So literally what we do with Horvick Research is explain for you or, or take the hard work out of for you searching the literature, evaluating the literature, and translating it into an easy language so that you can practice in an evidence-informed manner and um, for your patients that come in to see you. Because all you need to know is what you know, the main problems your patients are coming in for, you can then go onto our library and you'll find there these little webinars for you, what we call science gems, 
on a whole range of different topics and every month more topics get added to it. And we even have these little whiteboard animations that you can use for marketing uh, or in-house educating your patients about the science of chiropractic. Or it even, even a lot of people are using these little animations just so that they know how they can talk about an individual study that they find um, very powerful to talk about with patients. So on top of this, we have an online shop as well where you know we have um, posters and pamphlets and obviously my books. So if you're interested in any of those, um, they're at HeidiHorvick.net. But the easiest um, place to go is this link, DrHeidi.net, where we have the links to the handout for today at the closed Facebook group, where you can also ask uh, any questions that you like. There's also a link there to join our membership, our, our online uh, resource library, um, at an event discount specifically for you uh, wonderful people today. Uh, and there's also a link there to our um, uh, online shops. And also there for, there's links to the, um, these webinars, these upcoming webinars that, that I give on a regular basis if you're interested in following along any of that. So I'm, I'm done with my content now and more than happy to take questions if we still have time for that. Christy, over to you. Yes, we do have um, a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, is it important to have a conversation around the salutogenic benefits of chiropractic or is there research that it will arrest disease and or treat certain diseases? Okay, so the best, the best thing I, I, I personally believe, um, obviously I'm a little bit biased because I'm, I'm a scientist as well as a chiropractor, but I think it's really important to talk about the available science. And the available science is showing that we have a neuroplastic effect. So we change the way the brain perceives what's going on in the brain and the world around them. And there isn't an awful lot of research available that, that, that shows that we can um, uh, you know, treat disease of, of, of any kind other than you know, chronic pain, headaches, uh, neck pain, back pain, uh, minor sports injuries. There is significant clinical research to talk about colic, but there's very little topics that you can talk about. Um, the ones that you can talk about, again, that's why we go through topic by topic by topic on our online resource library, so that if there's a particular topic that you're interested in, you can, you can actually hear what has been done and what can you claim based on it. Um, obviously, you can say whatever you like, but if you want to make claims based on what the research says, that's why we've provided these summaries for you. So um, the, the other cool thing, though, on that point um, is that because of this link now of the prefrontal cortex, and, and it's direct link to the autonomic nervous system and the, in particular the parasympathetic nervous system, the inflammatory system and the immune system, is it's a really uh, great way to be able to explain um, why people might be getting better under your care. Not that we've done the studies yet that prove we can help these people, but if they are coming to you saying, hey, look, you know, my heart condition has improved, you know, and the only thing different has been your chiropractic care, could it be your care? then you could actually say, well, we actually haven't got any, any clinical trials showing that we can you know, help people with, with heart conditions. But what's really interesting is we have got uh, evidence from some brain scientists that have shown that we, we um, do make a difference to this part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. And that prefrontal cortex is actually you know, well-known uh, a connection to our inflammatory systems. It's actually our anti-inflammatory control. So it could be that my chiropractic care has helped your heart condition by reducing the inflammatory levels in your body because we're affecting the prefrontal cortex. So that would be an example of how you could explain why someone was getting better, even though we haven't done that clinical research yet. So I don't know if that's answering the question, but that's kind of the best I can. <laughs> um, so I, this is a great question. As a researcher, does the Insight Subluxation Station Test, Thermal, uh, SEMG, HRV, have enough validity for you to use in practice and why? Great question. Um, I, I'm all for uh, these, these systems. There's several systems in, um, available out there where you can actually measure nervous system function. So the subluxation station, the CLA subluxation station is one of them. Uh, the Neuroinfinity system uh, from Richard Barwell's system is another one. Um, we are actually working with both Richard and David at the moment to, to test their systems against uh, our gold standards. And they've probably tested them themselves, but before, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of an anal scientist. Until I've actually tested it myself, I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't go claim yay or nay. But I do believe that, that they are good enough to use in practice so long as you use them very uh, consistently, ethically, reliably. You, if you make your best effort to, to test very carefully um, their, their, um, their, their nervous systems, then it's worthwhile doing. One particular part that I'm particularly, I could go on for probably four hours just on this topic alone, so you're going to have to stop me here, but one particular part that I'd really like to highlight is that that heart rate variability is brilliant to measure in patients. If you don't want to invest in big systems, all you need to do is go to a sports shop and buy one of those chest straps that you know you can get in any in sports shops. And you could even, you know, you could either sell them in practice or you could use them in your practice in your waiting room you know, every six visit or so, just get them to sit down quietly. But ideally, they'd be using themselves in the morning when they first get out of bed. They're only about $100, so that it's not like a huge investment. And, and all you really need to know is, is you want heart rate variability to go up. It means that your you know, heart rate variability is, is, is uh, very well linked with, you know, p- p- person's perceived um, health status. It's also d- almost directly linked with, with prefrontal cortex function. So it's almost like a, a measure of your central nervous system's ability to adapt and cope with the stressors of your life. So all you really need to know is that that heart rate variability number needs to go up. So you don't need to be a brain scientist to use this kind of stuff, this technology in practice. You want your heart rate variability to go up and you want their morning resting heart rate to go down. Then they're in a healthier state than they were before. And that's a very, very easy thing. Again, we're actually doing a whole review on this topic of heart rate variability um, very shortly in our on our online uh, resource library because it's such a cool tool to use in practice. But no, very good question. Well, thank you, Heidi, so much for doing this, y'all. Like I said, this is our first international webinar because she is in the middle of her European tour. Um, and I'm so excited that I actually got to see her a few weeks ago when we were in, now I can't even remember, oh, oh, we were in Iowa. Iowa. Yeah, we were. Yeah. <laughs> We were in Iowa together just before she left to go to Europe, and, and now she won't be back in the U.S. until this summer when she's going to be um, in Alabama, and then in August she'll be at the Wave and in yep. Tennessee for the Southern Chiropractic Conference. So let me just tell you, if you've never seen How Do You Speak Live and in person, like a webinar is just not enough time for you to <laughs> fully engage um, with her because, one, not only is she brilliant, but she's probably like the funniest person I have ever met and she's super animated and so you don't get all of that fun when you don't get to see her live and in person so if you are in Alabama I've been very well behaved Chrissy haven't I in this one you have you know I made a special slide just for you though just in case because (laughs) y'all she's a sassy thing let me just tell you my very first speaking event in the fall on my like seven-week tour of the U.S., I spoke with um, Heidi and Chris, Dr. Christina in Utah, and let me That's just right. tell y'all, they are sassy, larger than life, and I was like, oh my goodness, they brought me to come in with the two of them, like, nobody is going to be entertained by this little girl from the South when you're standing there with Heidi and Christina, because they're colorful, exciting. Let me just tell you, there were lots of people who were throwing their hands in the air going, hell yeah, go chiropractic. It was like being at a rock concert. That did not happen in my room. Only happened in Heidi's and Christina's. But let me just tell you, most fun that I had at a chiropractic event, and I was saying a lot because I'd already been following you around the country for a couple of weeks. So if Heidi's going to be at an event near you, I am telling you, don't miss this opportunity to hear her live and in person. If you only go to hear Heidi, do that. Trust me, you'll send me a thank you note. I know y'all hear me say that a lot. Make sure you get her book. Unbelievable. I I am so passionate about chiropractic research. Um, Y'all know that. I talk about the amazing work of the Clinical Compass here. Um, Heidi and her research group unbelievable and if it wasn't for all of these amazing people who dedicate so much of their life and you have no idea but their life and their time to this research you have no idea the impact that it is having all over the world um, especially here in the U.S. when it comes to battling all of this insanity with reimbursement and proving the efficacy Mm. of the power of what you do seriously love it 
like this is my heart and my passion, but I am terrible at explaining it. But if you read Heidi's book, it teaches you how to explain it in like normal people terms. Because I'm not a doctor of chiropractic. I am just, as Baron likes to say, he and I were chiropractic groupies. So, <laughs> thank you so much for being on this webinar today. I just want to remind you all next week we have Dr. Nicole Avina, another PhD, talking about the science of sugar. And she's wrapping up April, and then we're opening up May with Doctor, uh, not Doctor, with Garrett Gunderson talking about cash flow optimization, how to keep more of what you make. Um, and I will tell you all that's going to be a completely different webinar than what we've done before because actually it's more of a podcast style. So we'll see what you all think about that. But I will tell you that um, Garrett, amazing person, um, seriously, the, the amazing, brilliant minds that we've had on the webinar so far this year, including Heidi. They've been listening to me talk about you now for five months because I'm like, Heidi, how is it going to be on the webinar series every single week? So I'm super stoked. Well, thanks that, for having you know, me, Christy. <laughs> Fab Garrett, Dave Jackson, all these guys that are like, you know, coming in behind you. They got a lot. They got big shoes to fill. So, everybody, y'all have an amazing rest of your day and a fabulous week. And thank y'all for being here. Thank you. Bye. Okay, hottie.